also welcome from my side again to this second of my three lectures. Uh, I've been talking yesterday about these magnetized Rydberg atoms where the field has such a strong impact that it changes the system classically from regularity to chaos, it changes the level statistics properties, changes the threshold behavior, which you then can also describe via these nice semi-classical theories. Now, uh, as you might have realized yesterday, there was a second part which was about magnetic trapping. I'm going to skip that completely. And I move over to exotic Rydberg species in fields. You will learn in a minute what exotic means over here. Now, this is uh, the agenda for today. Uh, maybe a little more now and there, uh, depending on how much time is left. I'll give you an introduction into what we call giant dipole atoms in crossed electric and magnetic fields. Crossed means uh, perpendicular electric and magnetic fields. Uh, there are some subtleties in the theory which you need to understand, which is then particularly uh, contained in this uh, chapter, pseudo-separation gauge independent potential picture, which describes these systems. Then I will give throw a series <coughs> of uh, these objects, one being single excitations, single excited giant dipole states. How, what are their properties, and maybe how to prepare, prepare them experimentally. Then you can make these exotic species even more exotic by using not only matter, by combining matter and antimatter. And then finally, multiple excitations, where you excite many electrons from an atom and uh, bring it to high excitations. Essentially, you're in the continuum, so these are resonances, giant dipole resonances. And I will conclude with some remarks. And the down there, which you cannot see, will be about n ions in strong magnetic fields. Hopefully, I will find some time to talk about these. So, uh, again, this refers to Rydberg physics. I don't need to address these things again. They have huge sizes, they have enormous level densities, huge dipole amount moments, <coughs> parasitability scales with n to the 7, the Fundervals coefficients with n to the 11, and you get long lifetimes. Now, um, this is the spectrum you saw yesterday, this mass, this spaghetti of levels within changing magnetic fields. Uh, now, this is not what we're going to be addressing today. We go towards these exotic species, yeah? And these exotic species are in cross electric and magnetic fields, and they represent new quantum states of matter, as you shall see. Now, yesterday, I have been telling you, or I've been addressing the Hamiltonian of the hydrogen atom, in particular, in a strong magnetic field, and you had the Zeeman term, and you had the diamagnetic term. But I was assuming that you have a fixed nucleus. That means the mass of the nucleus is essentially taken to be infinite. You nail down the nucleus in space, and then you let only the electron move. Now, without magnetic field, <coughs> in field-free space, this is all fine, because you have a space translational symmetry, and therefore, the total momentum, which is identical to the total canonical, to the total kinetic, this is all the same, the total momentum is conserved. This is the translation invariance of the system, in free space. And that leads to the separation of the center of mass motion. So you have a free center of mass motion. Uh, classically, that's just a straight line. Or quantum mechanically, it's a plane. <coughs> now, if you turn to homogeneous magnetic or the combination of magnetic and electric fields, this is not true anymore. You can see that easily. The total momentum, now the total canonical momentum, the capital P, which is the sum of the momenta of the individual particles, that is not commuting with the Hamiltonian of your system, which is the Hamiltonian including the nucleus, which couples to the magnetic field, and the electron, which couples to the magnetic field. Now, that means something is going on here, which is uh, that symmetry which you have over here is not valid anymore. Now, originally that comes from the fact, of course, in a homogeneous magnetic field, everywhere <coughs> things look the same wherever you are because the field is homogeneous. But the Hamiltonian has in it the vector potential, which is written here as an A. And that vector potential is not spatially invariant. And that indeed leads 
to the replacement of the symmetry, the space translation symmetry, to a phase space translation symmetry. You can prove that. And that phase space translation symmetry is connected with what people call the pseudo momentum. And this pseudo momentum is given here. It's a combination of the normal canonical momentum and the vector potential and the B field stuff. So the vector potential has also the B field in it, but it is this, this specific combination which is valid for any gauge uh, in, uh, <coughs> concerning the magnetic field. Now, this quantity. If you take this and build the commutator with the Hamiltonian, which has in it the magnetic terms of the nucleus and the electrons and the interaction between the nucleus and the electron, then you see that the commutator vanishes. So the normal total canonical momentum is replaced by this pseudo momentum as a constant of motion in the presence of the magnetic field. Now, what is the meaning of this case? Yeah. I don't want to go into algebra, but I want to just give you a bit of a physical feeling what this K means. Of course, if you put P equal to zero, then these terms drop, and you have sum of Pi, which is this. So in the special case of zero field, it goes back to the normal canonical total momentum. It has the meaning of the total kinetic momentum of the system. That's fine. So we have that limit in our theory. Now, let's go to the case that B is unequal zero, and we have no direction among the particles. Then you can show the following, which is very, maybe intuitively, uh, not very, uh, 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 not very intuitive. Um, this K, which I've shown you here, has the meaning of the guiding center of a superposition of vectors to the midpoints of the cyclic particles. Because in a magnetic field and no interaction, what the particles do, they are on a cyclotron radius. Each one is cycling on its radius. The one over here and the other one over here. And this K, this pseudo-momentum is proportional for a neutral system, particles of opposite charges, to the difference vector of these guiding center vectors. This is the vector to the midpoint here of the particle, of the cycling of the particle. This is the vector to that midpoint and the difference. This is proportional to K. So the two limits, only magnetic field, no interaction, or interaction at no magnetic field, K has very different meanings. Either kinetic momentum or a difference vector. Of course, it's always the dimension of momentum, so that means this is proportional to this, but there is a constant here which makes it finally to have the correct dimensions. So this is the meaning of it. This is known since, since many years. Uh, what is uh, the useful thing about this K is now you can perform a so-called pseudo-separation of the center of mass motion yeah? in the presence of the magnetic field. So the K helps you to do something which you're used to in the absence of a magnetic field, namely separating something. Yeah? The, in the absence of a field, you separate the total kinetic energy of the momentum, uh, the total momentum, and the center of mass motion. Here, you can use this K to do such a pseudo-separation. Now, what the result is as follows. This is what is given here. If you do that business of pseudo-separation, you end up with a Hamiltonian that looks like this Hamiltonian. Now, remember, K is conserved. K is conserved means uh, and it co and the co components of K do commute too. They're independent entities. That means, if you look at that Hamiltonian, this K finally is a constant. It's a constant of motion. K is a constant. So this is a constant. This is a constant. And it turns out that the canonical coordinate belonging to this pseudo-momentum is the center of mass coordinate. Now, the center of mass coordinate therefore does not appear in the Hamiltonian anymore. It's a cyclic coordinate. It's gone. Now, this is a constant. But you see also, although this is a constant here, there is still a coupling between center of mass and electronic motion. Because there's these type of terms yeah, that has the K in it, which is responsible for, for this pseudo, is the pseudo momentum responsible for the center of mass motion. And there's internal coordinates R. Now, what is the interpretation of this term? Now, this interpretation of this term physically is very easy. Look at it. It's 1 over capital M. K cross me, B, is momentum cross magnetic field. This is an electric field. 
This is because your system is neutral, is moving through the magnetic field, and it sees, therefore, through the motion, a motional electric field while moving through the magnetic field. So this is a motional electric field, which is known since many, many decades. Yeah. And so this is a term in use by the motion of the neutral, say, hydrogen atom in the magnetic field. But you should also observe the following, and this goes back to what I said, and this is a coupling term. If you take the classical equations of motion and take that term, minus E over 2m, k cross b, times R, yeah, now we take a simple coordinate, or if you would write it in the way how it appears in the Hamiltonian, namely as the mixed term uh, of, the, and you will see it later on, this term, as the mixed term of this quadratic term, K times this, then if you write down the equation of motion for the center of mass, capital R dot vector, this would be dH with respect to dK, and H depends on K via this term. So it would give you something 1 over M, K minus E B cross R. But now you see the following here. Yeah? This is center of mass velocity, and this is coupled to the electronic coordinate due to the presence of the magnetic field. Okay? So this is why this is indeed, <coughs> down here, a coupling term. Now, I want to discuss the effects of these kind of terms on the system, together with other terms. Now, why together with other terms? The, the issue is, <coughs> um, if you start from the Hamiltonian, and the original Hamiltonian, is of the form of kinetic energy plus potential term. So this is original Hamiltonian in the laboratory. <coughs> in the lab frame. Then this is, of course, something like H is equal to, I have one particle, which is the electron, P electron minus A electron squared plus a second term from the nucleus, um, say given an index n, and E nucleus minus E plus E A n squared, plus interaction. Now, uh, if you go back to that one, then you see this is kinetic energy. I think you know this from your classes. This term here, the whole square, is kinetic energy. It's not p squared over 2m, which is the kinetic energy in a magnetic field. It is the whole term here. And this is the kinetic energy of the nucleus. So one question which immediately <coughs> arises is, um, if this is all kinetic energy, and this is kinetic energy, and this is potential, <coughs> is this also true if I do the transformation and exploit the pseudo-separation? Now it turns out, and this has been a little bit of burden in the middle of the 90s, that uh, indeed there exists an gauge independent formalism according to which you can transform this one and exploit the pseudo uh, momentum. And this yields finally not only the potential, the Coulomb potential, as being a potential term in the uh, Hamiltonian, but a channelized potential. This channelized potential contains, of course, the Coulomb potential, but an extra term which has in it this and this and an extra term. <coughs> so let's look at this term, which comes out from this gauge invariant pseudo separation. Let's look at it. This, you see, is a k squared, if you take this square term, a k squared over 2m. This is the term we have over here. Then if you look at this uh, product here, the cross term, this is k. Then if a B cross R, this is exactly that type of term. You just put the cross product differently. You put K cross B times R instead of K cross R times B. So this is uh, the mixed term. And then there is a third term, which is the square of this term. This is B cross R squared. Okay? So we have in that gauge invariant potential three terms. 
a trivial constant, k squared over 2m, a mixed term of motional electric field and a p cross r squared term, which is essentially a harmonic oscillator <coughs> confining term. Okay, so this is a generalized potential. <coughs> if this is a generalized potential, let me try to interpret what it means. Now this is given here. Here are the terms again listed. Now for the simple case of only one electron. K squared over 2m term, B cross K times R, motional start term, diamagnetic term. And then, if you look into this, how this potential looks like, it is like this. If K is large enough, which means that the motional electric field is large enough, I can expect to get a start cell. You have not only the Kuno well, yeah, the Kuno well comes from the Kuno potential. But if you go to larger distances, I get a start settling, just as Tom Gallagher nicely explained, you get that electric field making a settle point. Then if you go to even larger distances, <coughs> you would like to go down due to the electric field, but at some point, this square term takes over, and you go up again. So this is in the directions perpendicular to the magnetic field. That just means that there is outwards, the energy is going down, and it's going up again. And that gives you, as you see in this picture, an outer well. So now you have not only a Kuno well, where you have bound states, <coughs> but you have also an outer well. And your system has, therefore, a double well structure. Yeah, this is because the electric field tries to tear away the electron from the nucleus. At the same time, the magnetic field supplies you confinement once you're gone from the nucleus. And th these two things provide an equilibrium, and this is this outer well. OK, so let's summarize what we have so far. <coughs> uh, this implies that ionization is not possible perpendicular to the magnetic field. Because here, these coordinates you can find, and this will take over at large distances. OK, then <coughs> sorry, we have the existence in the outer well of weakly bound states. Yeah, these are states which are living in here. Okay? The potential provides the confinement here. So we have these outer well states of where the electron and the proton are largely separated. Yeah? By microns. Very large distances. <coughs> and it's very different from normal Rydberg states, because in normal Rydberg states the electrons are cycling around the nucleus. It won't know another way, with little angular momentum or a lot of angular momentum. But they are centered at the nucleus, the wave functions. Here, the wave functions are completely decentered. They are centered because the nucleus is here, so they're decentered somewhere mm -hmm. out there. So you have something like this. It's vibrating the electron and the nucleus sitting somewhere completely else. <coughs> and this is a bound state. It is a bound state <coughs> because you have a strong electric and a strong magnetic. And, and this is what you call the giant dipole states, with a huge dipole moment, naturally, because the two charges are so widely separated. Uh, now, take this for hydrogen. You take a five Tesla fields. So when you're talking about these Gauss fields, you're talking about strong fields. Then you, you get something like 1 to 10 micron of the size of these atoms, which you can, of course, change if you with changing parameters. <coughs> Let's look a little more into these states. We have that potential, we have the outer potential well. And the, in, in the frame where you describe the system, of course, the electron has an additional kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy uh, looks very much like that. Yeah? For the effective particle after the pseudo separation. So you have that type of kinetic energy plus the, uh, this generalized potential. And if you look at the potential, naturally what you would do in order to describe the system, well, you calculate the equilibria out here, which is the minimum. You take the minimum, you expand the potential around the minimum, you take the kinetic energy, and you diagonalize the system. Now, this expansion you do to second order, which means you just have there, out there, a uh, second order expansion, how <coughs> plus the type thing. These terms here are of the type which you saw already yesterday, the b squared, x squared, plus y squared terms, and the blz, Zeeman terms. Now, that adds together, 
uh, and you can diagonalize this easily, it is, if you diagonalize it, again, a normal mode problem of harmonic oscillators. Yeah? But now, the frequencies, so maybe I should write down this, uh, this Hamiltonian, so you know what we start here with. So this Hamiltonian, which has been diagonalized here, has in it something, now I try to write it even with the correct masses. There's some reduced masses in this frame, one is called mu, another one mu prime, and then you have this vector potential there. And then you have this expansion. Now that gives you a constant in the outer well, and then you have something like an omega x squared, x squared, plus one half omega y squared, y squared. Okay? So this is the problem, simple harmonic oscillator of a charged particle in a magnetic field with that kinetic energy. Now, um, that kinetic energy involves the cyclotron frequency. The cyclotron frequency is given here. This is what the particle would do if it would be free in a magnetic field. Yeah? Now, the omega x and the omega y you obtain by expanding about this outer point. That involves different terms here, some from the magnetic field, because there's magnetic field dependent potential terms, and some from the Coulomb, because you expand the Coulomb potential at large distances. Yeah? You expand the Coulomb potential at points which are far from the singularity. The Coulomb looks like this. The outer well is somewhere out here, so you expand the Coulomb, say, in such a range yeah, out there where it has up to quadratic terms, and these are terms which are given here by this 1 over x naught to the third plus minus corresponding b. So this gives you the omega x and omega y, which are this omega x and this omega y, and the omega z, and the omega z which is along the magnetic field, which has no magnetic field dependent terms. Now, you put this together, and you diagonalize this Hamiltonian, and you get new frequencies, which you now call omega plus omega minus, and omega z. And then, to note, uh, these are three different modes now of the motion in the outer well. This is omega plus, which we call cyclotron mode, because it is essentially omega c. Then the omega minus is the center of mass mode, and the omega z is the Coulomb mode. Omega z is just motion along the magnetic field that is only dominated by Coulomb potential, so this is the Coulomb mode, and this is Mode. You have these three modes of harmonic oscillations as the lowest order approximation to the motion of the electron in the outer well. Uh, some more facts. We have a megahertz spacing typically of these states in the outer well. Many hundreds of bound states exist <coughs> out there. And uh, if you move up in the excitations, of course, this picture of harmonic expansion is no more valid. That can be seen over here, too. Look at that, this just gives you the deviation of, now this is delta E, that's the deviation of the energy of the levels in the outer well from the harmonic approximation, from the eigenvalues I get from this hematomy. And you see that this deviation has sort of stepwise behavior, uh, and that stepwise behavior when the deviations get larger with increasing level excitation, this is the excitation in the outer well, it goes over hundreds of states, that stepwise behavior comes from the fact that every time I get an extra excitation along the magnetic field, I do get such a step. So that just means that harmonicity is violated mostly by excitations parallel to the field. Now, you have this giant dipole states. You have huge dipole moments, uh, even bigger than the normal ones of, of Rydberg atoms, which are already large. Uh, now, a question which you can pose here, uh, these are exotic objects. You, you drag away the electron from the, from the nucleus. How, how can it get into these states? How could I prepare these states experimentally? And uh, we had been working out one suggestion in the late 90s, and I want to give you a brief outline how this could potentially work. Yeah? This is results of simulations over here, or actually of the classical dynamics of these systems. Now, the idea is the following here. Um, 
before I go to this preparation, maybe one remark before I uh, tell you a little bit about this preparation. Um, there is one way of forming this naturally in plasmas. And this is indeed what also has been observed. This is, if you have charges in a plasma, and you have strong electric and magnetic fields, then occasionally, of course, you will have collisions, and collisions might lead to the formation of these exotic objects. And indeed, in high anti-hydrogen experiments, uh, where you have anti-proton anti anti and positrons forming anti-hydrogen, this is what typically happens, because there, the whole dynamics and the recombination of the charged particles into neutral anti-hydrogen is taking place in traps, which naturally provides electric and magnetic fields. So, uh, but let me come back now to how one would prepare this if you want to do it uh, uh, on purpose. Now, one way to do it is, uh, what you do is, you switch fields. That means you take photons to get to normal Rydberg states, which would be in here in the Coulomb. Then you switch an electric field, like this one. This is an electric field switch from up to T1, time T1. Now, um, if you have done that switch, you have a Stark cell. Yeah? Uh, then you wait for a while. This is the waiting period. Then the particles will spread over the Stark cell, and then you do a second switch where you increase the electric field even further and drag down the particles into the outer belt. Now, here you see simulations how this happens indeed. Uh, this is after the first switch, while you have been waiting for a while. The particles spread out from the Coulomb <coughs> belt over the star cell to the outer well. And then you do the second switch, and then a time sequence later, this is what you obtain. You should take, sorry for this low resolution picture, you should note over here that this scale is centered around roughly. Uh, 6 times 10 to the 4, it's, it's decentered. Whereas this one uh, roughly goes from 0 to something. So here there's the origin, and then they spread out, and the center here is out there. Okay? So this is then uh, an ensemble of particles which are in the outer well. And, uh, and then here you see the distribution of the energy in the outer well. Of course, if you go over the star cell and down into the outer well, what happens is that you have a separatrix crossing, if you consider that classically, and that makes an energy spreading. So you have to take care how you do the switch a little bit. But that finally gives you this spreading. This is the energy, the probability of finding particles, a histogram of finding particles in a certain energy interval, and you see this distribution. And this dashed line is the ionization threshold. So you see a lot of particles which are bound in the outer line. Okay, um, let me now go to even more exotic objects. Trying to apply this to something which is a combination of a matter-antimatter <coughs> system. Yeah. Say, positronium, yeah? which is a positron and an electron. So I do replace the nucleus with uh, a positron, and the electron remains the electron. <coughs> Now, the masses do change, and that has impact, because I'm doing a real two-body treatment, so that impacts my uh, shape of the potential in the sense that the scales become different, and the whole size of the object shrinks. Yeah? Due to the light mass of E+, plus, instead of the heavy mass of the nucleus, my uh, gauge, my uh, potential shrinks. <coughs> Uh, but this is not the most important point. The most important point is that now I have a system where I have an E plus and an E minus, which usually, if you make them to atoms, annihilate on time scales of nanoseconds. Here, what happens is you put the E plus over here, or the E minus, and the corresponding to the other particle over there. And they are separated by a barrier. Yeah? You, you see it hardly here, but this is a substantial <coughs> barrier here. Yeah? Therefore, the particles cannot get in contact with the body. That means there is a tunneling barrier which suppresses annihilation. And if you do that with normal, strong laboratory magnetic fields, what you end up with is uh, lifetimes of years. 
So what you've done is creating a stable E plus, E minus system as giant dipole states of positronium. Um, this is just a picture here how the evolution of the normal states living in uh, uh, Rydberg states uh, centered around the Coulomb potential and the position of E plus in this case evolves to an outer well state. Now this is the Coulomb field state. This it evolves elliptically with the strength of the electric field into an outer well state. Now this is just showing you the contact probability, the probability of annihilation. You see, if you increase the electric field here, then you get a sudden drop at some point by many, many orders of magnitude. Uh, this is because you isolate the two particles from each other. You separate them. And then you get this stable system. Now that has kind of inspired a little bit the fantasy of people, but not only the fantasy. Uh, so people have been thinking about this, how do you, do you can get uh, fuel, yeah, because if you store these particles and then you let them release again, you get on demand 511 keV radiation, which is a nice source of energy. And indeed, um, Air Force has here in the US, uh, as it turned out, uh, I didn't get that information at the beginning, but uh, um, over here, uh, uh, but I was informed that they invested a millions program how to store these particles yeah. and even to build accelerators on these. Yeah. Storage so, it's not exactly. So, um, but let's come back to, uh, to real physics. Um, I have done the story of putting one particle being decentered from my atomic core. Now, what prevents me from putting several particles into this outer well? Nothing prevents me except that these will not be bound states, but will be resonances. Yeah? Now, uh, look into that. If you write down the gauge independent potential with n electrons, it looks like this. So now you see that there is a sum of all electronic coordinates here. Now, in this term, be reminded this term was responsible for the trapping of the particles in the outer well. This is now not appealing to every coordinate separately. There's not a potential term separately, but it appeals to the sum of these particles, of the coordinates. That means it appeals to the uh, electronic center of mass. Yeah, this is the electronic center of mass. Okay, so then let's try to learn what happens if we uh, try to prepare such giant dipole states for multi-electron systems. So somehow the electronic center of mass is decentered. But where are the electrons then? So let's see that. What we have to do, we have to do our business with our Hamiltonian. We have this electronic, now I'm introducing new coordinates, we have this electronic center of mass Hamiltonian, we have the remaining electronic <coughs> relative coordinates, we have all of these potential terms, and I don't want to go through that. Uh, I just want to show you, uh, I just want to tell you first what you have to do, and then want to show you a picture. So what do you have to do? You have this potential, which is now here for two electrons, and you have to find the equilibrium of the system. Two electrons are out there. What is the configuration? I have to find, of the six-dimensional surface, the stationarities. OK, you can do that. You can go through that. You have the six nonlinear coupled equation of motion. But if you are a little smart and think about it, uh, instead of doing numerics immediately, uh, you come to the idea, well, maybe what I could do, I track the set of mass of the electrons out there. So my potential is something like this. Confining. So I trap somewhere the center of mass of the particles here, of the electrons. So the electron could be somewhere here, and the other one maybe would be there. Now this is not magical metric, because this is energy. This is just a, a graphical uh, uh, illustration. So um, or it could be also here, and could be there. And from this, you can make a good guess. Uh, you assume somehow that this inter-electronic coordinate R and the center of mass of the electrons is perpendicular to each other. Then you get immediately some of these coordinates put to zero, 
<coughs> and you can reduce actually things to a one-dimensional equation for one point, <coughs> namely the position, <coughs> the position of this point in these x coordinates. That's the capital X. Okay, fine. So, and then you can give criteria when these has uh, uh, real solutions. If you go through this, then you obtain this condition. And if this condition is fulfilled, now this gives you the pseudo momentum, the mass and the B field, the magnetic field. Uh, if this condition is fulfilled, you get two real negative solutions, and, uh, uh, and one of them corresponds to a settled point, and the other one is indeed a minimum. This is this out of well point. And this is how it looks like. You have, uh, say, a helium atom, a helium core, a helium nucleus, and the two electrons are there, and the two electrons are the center of mass of the electrons is captured. This is the electron here and here, this is the center of mass of the electrons. It's captured out there, and they are allowed sort of to freely rotate out there. This is the configuration which you use to check <coughs> um, Now, if you analyze this in the sense that what are the modes <coughs> the normal modes of the motion of this configuration, then you end up with this. There is a zero mode. This is the rotation here. Yeah, this is all energetically equivalent. Yeah, there is, uh, and, and there is other um, five modes of the six dimensional problem, which decouple into different subspaces. And in the following, I would like to talk a little bit about these different modes. First of all, there is cyclotron modes, modes which are energetic. There is modes called cooler modes, which have to do with the motion along the magnetic field. And there is center of mass mode, which is associated with the uh, heavy part of cyclotron motion. And there's this zero mode of rotations. Now, for this specific case of two electrons, all frequencies in the harmonic expansion are real, and there's no decay. That indicates this.